Thank you and good evening. Thank you for joining us for a conversation on education with Joel Klein, former chancellor of the New York City Department of Education, moderated by Jillian Jorgensen, New York One education reporter, with special guest, Stevie Van Zandt. We are live on Twitter and YouTube. Please retweet, please press play on the video and comment and share with your friends. Let us know where you're watching from. We'll start today's program with a short video. It's the School of Rock. I'm Vic Nguyen in Fullerton at Orangethorpe Elementary School, where students and teachers here are the first to use a brand new program called Teach Rock. We have a report now that a large plane crashed this morning in Western Pennsylvania. This lesson has these students' eyes glued to the TV screen. Marissa Gomez and her classmates weren't even alive during 9-11, but this clip has their undivided attention. Marissa is a second grader in a multi-age classroom at Orangethorpe Elementary School in Fullerton. Instead of learning about the 2001 terrorist attack by reading about it in a book, her teachers, Nancy Karcher and Pam Keller, are using a program called Teach Rock, which uses songs like Only in America. Sun coming up over New York City by country music duo Brooks and Dunn to help students learn about historic events and how it changed the country. I bet whoever made it was feeling sad and didn't really want to open it, like didn't really want to sing the song, but they had the courage to do it in front of everybody because if the people didn't know that it happened and like they didn't know what was happening, then they would know because of the song. Orangethorpe is the first school in the country to partner with the Teach Rock Foundation, which was founded by Stephen Van Zandt. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Stephen Van Zandt. He's a famous guitarist known for performing alongside Bruce Springsteen, and he's using his fame to lead the foundation in making arts a core part of public education. Their target are the kids who are at risk of dropping out of school. We want to focus on them and, and try and keep them in school. If a kid likes one class or one teacher, they'll stay in school. Uh, the last report I just saw, if we can improve the graduation rate by 5%, uh, we will save society $18 billion dollars in, in, in crime costs, you know, because half the kids that drop out end up in prison. Longtime teacher Pam Keller agrees. She says she's seen a lot of teaching trends over the last 30 years, but nothing like this. I think music is just a universal language. They all, they, you, you find emotion in music. She says all of her students get so excited every time they're about to learn something from the Teach Rock lesson plan. Teaching 9-11 is a really difficult thing to do with elementary students. It just really is. And every year we kind of struggle with how is it that we're going to talk to our new students about this. And so this has really helped us this year. Pam says this program helps teachers connect with students that they might not be able to reach otherwise. As for second grader Marissa, who doesn't remember what it's like not to have Teach Rock be part of her class, she says she does know that she does not want to go back to a time when music wasn't a part of her lesson. Thank you. And now to kick off tonight's conversation is Bill Carbone, executive director of the Rock and Roll Forever Foundation. Hi, my name is Bill Carbone and I am the executive director of the Rock and Roll Forever Foundation. Thank you for joining us in this conversation about current issues in education. The Rock and Roll Forever Foundation's mission is to empower teachers and engage students by using popular music to create interdisciplinary culturally responsive educational materials for all 21st century classrooms. It's a mouthful, I know, so I'll quickly break it down. There are places in the United States where more than 40% of students don't finish high school. And in some communities, 60% of that 40% later serve time in prison. The cost to those people, their communities, and to all of us is immense. Of course, there are many reasons a student might drop out. But research shows that if a student likes one class or establishes a meaningful bond with a single teacher, that student is likely to keep coming to school. Teach Rock empowers teachers to harness that excitement and energy of music 
to engage their students and build that bridge between generations. We want to be the class that keeps kids coming to school. We do that not just by being fun, but by living up to the interdisciplinary in our mission through using music as a gateway to all subjects. Teach Rock teachers aren't wearing guitars. They're making connections between the music we love, the people who make it, and the times and places from which it came. The teachers you just saw on the news clip we just rolled weren't singing about 9-11. They were introducing young students to the events of that day through the ways American musical culture responded, and it works. And teaching with popular music also creates inherently culturally responsive classrooms, because through it, we see men and women of all ethnicities and socioeconomic backgrounds as important contributors to the fabric of our society. And Teach Rock is for the 21st century classroom because unlike expensive, clunky, and quickly outdated textbooks, the open sourced, standards aligned online materials that teachrock.org continually evolves to make connections between a student's present experience and the bedrock concepts of the classroom, or as the case is currently, the student's kitchen table. And as you'll see later, Teach Rock curriculum has proved incredibly useful during this time of distance learning. Everything Teach Rock creates is offered to districts, teachers, and students at no cost whatsoever. Nationwide, nearly 40,000 teachers are registered at teachrock.org. And here in New York, the curriculum is used in more than 100 schools throughout the New York Edge after school system. Of course, though, it's not free to create. So we hope that you'll enjoy tonight's conversation with these distinguished thought leaders, and that you'll also visit us at teachrock.org slash donate and join us in our mission to improve student outcomes and lives through the arts. Now I'm gonna turn the event over to our fabulous moderator, New York One education reporter, Jillian Jorgensen. But we're gonna to get to know her a little better first by seeing a clip of her work. If anything, having kids at home, forcing parents and caregivers to take on the schoolwork has led to a renewed appreciation for our teachers. As education reporter Jillian Jorgensen found out, getting the kids to learn at home is quite a challenge. Sebastian is one of more than a million students forced to suddenly shift to learning from home three weeks ago, a change that has turned the lives of parents upside down. For me, uh, it's been a huge change. New York One assembled a virtual panel of three parents to tell us how they're juggling work, family, and schooling while stuck at home. A sign of how hard that is, mom Caroline Wong shared her experience while her four-year-old daughter played with her hair. I have to keep this one busy. Uh, obviously, I have my new hairdo now. <laughs> um, we, she does remote learning, which is a, a really difficult thing for her just because what the her school emphasizes it's all about learning through play sebastian's mom jenny uyoa balances working full-time with helping sebastian who is dyslexic adjust to the online reading and writing now required of him he was asking me how to spell things every two seconds and then at one point i asked him to ask alexa how to spell words but then she just kept spelling words all day long. She worries about the intensive phonics and reading help he's missing out on, as well as counseling he received at school that's now on hold. But that will be now four or five weeks since he's had those sessions, and there's a lot of emotions that come to play. Tamika Hall is juggling three school-aged children and her job, closing doors and setting boundaries for important work calls. Sometimes I hear the commotion, and I'm just like, wait. Uh, well, who's fighting? Why are they fighting? Can you just stop yeah. fighting? <laughs> Hall also had to scramble to buy new Chromebooks just to get all her kids online at the same time, with the school sending home just one laptop per family. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll try to work it out. And then when I saw what the schedule was going to be, I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is a joke. I can't do this. Parents say support is key to getting through all of this. Wong has a group text string with other parents at her children's schools. So if you are confused, I constantly ask them and I don't feel scared and they they tell me things like, oh, I, I, we gave up today. And I'm like, we too. There are plenty of setbacks. The important thing, these moms say, is bouncing back. You'll cry, your child will cry. You might have some screaming matches, but be patient because there's always a solution to problems. Jillian Jorgensen, New York One. 
Thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation. Uh, I'm so glad we were all uh, able to see a little bit of my work. And I just want to say it's been a real uh, honor to just, you know, talk about what teachers, students, families have been going through these last few months with remote learning. So I'm glad that we can have this conversation today. I'm going to pivot now to introduce our guest, Joel Klein, who is the Chief Policy and Strategy Officer at Oscar Health, but of most interest to our audience, I suspect, is his tenure as New York City Schools Chancellor from 2002 through 2010. He led the nation's largest public school system, from which I, by the way, am a proud graduate. Uh, he also served in the U.S. Department of Justice as Deputy White House Counsel to President Clinton and for the education technology company Amplify, among other prominent roles. Uh, but I look forward to speaking with him tonight about his time running the city's schools and about the current education landscape in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so, Mr. Klein, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, let's let's start the conversation. It's good to be with you, Jillian. Thank you. Thank you. And let's jump right in and let's start with the big question that I think is on everybody's mind right now. Should schools reopen and in person this September? You sure hope so, right? It's really a bad thing for our kids if schools are closed. And, and, and it's, you know, people have done noble work over the last several months trying to do distance learning. But we want to get our kids back in school. The question is, can we do it intelligently, safely? We don't want to jeopardize anyone, not our teachers, not our kids. But I think if it's at all possible, even if it has to be prioritized, we have got to get kids back to school. Yeah, and you know, I, I know that uh, during your tenure, you were really big on tracking data. And one of the things that I often think about or have thought about since March is that it feels a little bit like we've been in this giant forced experiment of 1.1 million students in the New York City public school system thrown into remote learning, them and their teachers and their parents. Um, and I'm curious, if you were still chancellor now, what kind of data would you want to see from that time period to see what worked, what didn't, and what could maybe be a model for a, a way forward, even post-pandemic? I mean, you want to start with very basic stuff. You want to start with how much time are the kids actually online? How much are they absorbing? Then you want to figure out, are they learning? Are they not just watching? with learning, so that you'd have to have soft kind of testing to measure those kind of things. You wanna see over time which classes are getting better results, which kids are more engaged, all the kind of things you do when you're running a school system live, you run it virtually and you try to get the same kind of data and information. Because what you gotta learn in public education, which is hard, people don't like to learn that things sometimes work one place, you should copy that, you should replicate it, you should build on it. You don't have to let everybody do his or her own thing. And that's the kind of things we're doing now. Only with the remote learning, distance learning, it's going to be harder to do for a whole bunch of reasons because the key ingredient in much of, particularly with younger children, is getting that human connection to the teacher. It's one of the reasons when you ask me about the fall, if you start out with distance learning, you remember last year, kids had six, seven, eight months of schooling with their teacher before they weren't remotely. So they had that human connection. This year, if they start out remotely, it's gonna be that much more difficult. And believe me, it wasn't easy even after you had a direct connection with the kid, with the teacher. Yeah, you know, kind of building off what you just said, one suggestion that I had heard from some folks is that um, cities and school districts should prioritize the youngest students for getting back. The idea that high schoolers are a little bit more capable of handling remote learning on their own. They don't necessarily need parental supervision. I'm curious what you make a, of, of that thought and particularly around children who are at the age where they're learning to read, uh, where they're building literacy. Uh, you know, what do you think about that kind of triaging? Well, you were reading my mind. If I, if I had a triage, I'd go for the young. I'd go for the young for two reasons. Again, because this is where the formative years, you know, we, we always used to say K to three is when kids learn to read so that after third grade, they can read to learn. And if a kid's two, three, four years behind after they finish the third grade, you're starting to a climb that is almost impossible to reverse. And so, and, and there, the intervention of the teacher, the ability to connect one-on-one -on -one with a kid, to understand that this child has a different set of learning issues from this child, those are such vital, critical issues. So if you had to prioritize, and I w hope you don't, but if you did, I would certainly go young because that's where I think you get the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah, and you know, I mean, obviously all of these 
plans are sort of being worked up on the fly. Um, but one thing I'm curious about is during your tenure uh, at the city school system, whether you ever planned for something like a pandemic in 2009, a handful of schools in, in uh, Queens, I believe, were closed uh, due to the spread of swine flu. But I'm curious if there was ever, you know, during your time, a plan for a bigger picture shutdown, obviously something really unprecedented. I mean, you had after 9-11 and certainly, you know, when you had swine flu, you had to be thinking about it. And we had plans if we had to shut down. And thank goodness it never got to that. As you said, we shut down a few schools uh, over swine flu, but it never got to that. And it's really suboptimal. And in that respect, you got to give a lot of people a lot of credit. I mean, they made the shift. They did what they could. But it really is, no matter how good it is, it's still suboptimal not to have children in school with their teacher. I always thought the essence of a great education, particularly for young children, is what Martin Buber calls the I-thou relationship. It's a human connection that can motivate, that can differentiate, and that, that's really mission critical for our children. Yeah, and you know, I mean, so much of, I think the conversation about how to make remote learning better um, focuses around a lot of education technology options. Uh, and I, as a reporter, I don't think I've ever gotten more uh, pitches about ed tech uh, than I have over the last few months. That's a world that you're really familiar with. And I'm curious what you think makes for a, a good use of you know, uh, online or digital curriculum. What makes for good ed education technology uh, software or programs? And you know what some of the pitfalls are, because there have been obviously a lot of companies that rise up and don't end up being successful. And of course, you know, I mean, now we're seeing tons of technology out there in the hands of children and teachers. Um, you know, give me a sense of kind of the, the ups and the downs here. Sure. I, I think, look, basically the, the main thesis that I've always had is the teacher has to be the center of the learning experience, right? So if you just put a kid online without any teacher, without any engagement with the teacher, then I think, I'm not saying it's worth nothing, but it's not worth what we need for our children. Now, you then think about, can you build technology around the teacher so that she can differentiate better, so that she can get her kids more engaged? There's things you can do online for kids that are terrific, and in that way, support them. Stuff that's engaging, stuff that's coherent. You know, you can't have what I call sort of a grab bag of curricula. You've got to have things that build on things so that kids learn in a coherent, meaningful way. I mean, that, when you think about vocabulary, we think about reading. So to me, I've always thought we've got to have technology in support of, not in substitution for our teachers. And then it's like anything else. Why, why do people watch anything? Because it's engaging, because it's interesting, because it challenges them. It makes them think. And that, to the extent we're seeing more of that, that's good stuff. But I, I want to be clear about it. It's got to be stuff that empowers, strengthens, makes our teachers better. When we start to think, particularly in the younger grades, of an online experience divorced from teaching, that's going to be a big mistake. Yeah, you know, and to that end, uh, one of the big uh, discussions and, and maybe minor controversies about remote learning in New York City was that uh, at the end of the regular school year, there wasn't a requirement for live teaching. So the idea of a teacher talking to kids over Zoom or Google Classrooms or anything like that, I'm curious what you think the value of live teaching, even over uh, these kind of electronic mediums, uh, would be in the future, assuming we may not be able to be back in school full time. Um, how much live teaching do you think uh, should be woven into uh, the curricula? Julian, as much as possible. I mean, I start with in the classroom. Then if it's going to be distance learning or remote, I believe it should be teacher generated, teacher run. I mean, I taught a class down at uh, Tulane not so long ago. And it was suboptimal, but at least it was myself, questions, people coming at you, that sort of thing. Just putting a kid on to watch a movie without a teacher, I, I think, you know, I wouldn't say zero, but it ain't great. Yeah, you know, um, let's talk a little bit about your legacy in the New York City public school system. Um, one of the uh, big endeavors of your time uh, leading the schools was moving to smaller schools, particularly around high schools. Uh, for people who aren't from New York City, there were some really massive high schools. There still are a few uh, that serve many thousands of children. And uh, under uh, 
your tenure, many of them were broken up into smaller schools within the same building. And uh, a lot of the research does show that those students went on uh, to do better than uh, they might have if they had been in a large school. And I'm curious, uh, what do you think made that model successful? And again, it sort of parallels a lot of what we've been talking about, Jillian. It's the connection. It's the human connection. So if you have a school with a whole bunch of kids, let's say 3,000 students, like some of the Vander Childs up in the Bronx, there's 3,000 students, the, and, and many of them come to high school two, three years behind. The anomie of that experience, the depersonalization makes it so much harder. So what we try to do is make these schools much smaller, much more intimate, much more personal. We also wanted people to start these schools so they could bring in their own team. They could hire the people they thought were right for their schools, their communities, and so forth. And the results, as you say, this has been studied every which way till Sunday. There's been probably half a dozen, eight different studies on it. And the results, while you'd always wish for better, showed that we significantly improved the high school graduation rate for those kids by, in some schools, doubled, more than doubled the outcomes all of which was good, but it goes to what I think is what the basic theme of what you and I have been talking about, which is the teacher in the classroom is the critical variable. And so everything we ought to think about when we think about the issues we're facing now as a country in terms of equality and equity and so forth, making sure we get great teachers, inspired teachers, committed teachers in our schools. It's the hardest job but it is an heroic job and it's most important in communities where traditionally they've been underserved, where they get large turnover of teachers and they don't get the kind of engagement that they need. And that ought to be a major focus of ours. And it worked, as you say, in the small high schools. Yeah, you know, that's, that's interesting. Another aspect of your legacy that I want to pivot to is under uh, your time at the DOE and under Mayor Bloomberg, there was a large growth in the number of charter schools in New York City. I, you know, I talk about a controversial issue, right? In education, I but I knew you were going to get to the word controversial. I mean, <laughs> waited a whole half an hour. <laughs> well, you know what? All news is controversial, or we wouldn't be talking about it, right? So let's. Uh, well, let... I really enjoy being introduced as the controversial chancellor because, <laughs> to me, in life, you have a choice: you can be controversial and consequential or you can be non-controversial and inconsequential. So I enjoy being called controversial. Absolutely. Well, you know, the question I have for you about charters is in recent weeks, there's been a lot of discussions around, um, while that many of them provide better outcomes for than t traditional district schools in terms of test scores and graduation rates, there's been some discussion of the disciplinary tactics used at them and the idea that often it's mostly uh, black and Hispanic students being faced with pretty harsh or strict rules uh, by white teachers. And this has led to a bit of a pushback at Success Academy. Some charters have relaxed some of their disciplinary standards. I'm curious for your take on that line of criticism, given the current moment that we're in with the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, uh, look, like any of these criticisms, I think people should take them seriously and engage the community. I start with the proposition, and I think the people who are watching tonight would share this. People want a choice for where they send their kids to school. When I was chancellor, I used to ask, do I know anyone who would let me randomly assign their child to a public school in New York? And they'd say, no, there were some great schools, schools that they wanted their kids to go to, but nobody would say randomly assign. So I start with, and particularly for people of color and particularly in high needs communities, they want choices too. The proof of that is when I was chancellor, I started out, there were probably 10,000 kids in charters. Today there's well over 150,000 mostly children of color. That's because those parents chose that school. Now, when you bring your kid to a school, that doesn't mean you drop her off and have nothing to do with the school. You're involved with the school. If there are issues of discipline, if the discipline is excessive, those are things the parents, the boards of the schools ought to engage in, ought to make sure that there's sensitivity to, and we all grow and learn together. But I just saw today a press release on success. You haven't mentioned success. See the results they got on their AP history exams, advanced placement history exams, way above most schools in high affluent communities. I mean, extraordinary outcomes. So yes, we always want to improve. Yes, we want to engage our communities. School is not the kind of place like you drop somebody off and you go home and you forget about it. 
And yes, we want to make sure we keep those things that are valuable. And in the end, there's a reason why today in New York City, there are 50,000 families, almost all families from poverty communities, families of color, still on waiting lists for charter schools. And I think that speaks volumes. Now, nothing in New York is without controversy. But <laughs> in my view, let the parents decide these things for their children. People who are watching us tonight on, on this cast, they want to decide for their kids. I suspect most parents want those choices. Yeah. Well, here I'm going to pivot for a moment, and I'm actually going to bring into our conversation Steve Van Zandt, a man who needs no introduction to this group, uh, but I will anyway. He's a musician, a performer, uh, a songwriter, music producer, actor, and director, a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and perhaps more importantly, the New Jersey Hall of Fame. He's a founding member of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band and a solo artist with his band, Little Steven and the Disciples of Soul, who I had the pleasure of seeing perform on the Soul Fire Tour in 2018 on, uh, on Staten Island, my hometown. You may also know Stevie from his starring roles in The Sopranos and Lilyhammer. And of course, you know him for his work with the Rock and Roll Forever Foundation, which launched the Teach Rock Initiative to help educators use the history of popular music to create multicultural lesson plans uh, at no cost to teachers. Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss these issues. And thank you for joining us. My pleasure. How are you uh, doing? I'm, I'm well, thanks. Thanks. Uh, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. Let's let's dive right in. You know, I already <laughs> asked, I posed this question to Joel, but for you, Stevie, uh, I'm curious uh, whether you think schools should open in person this fall. I saw you tweeting a bit uh, about your, your take that you think it might be unsafe, even urging teachers to strike. So g give me your thoughts on this uh, complicated discussion. Well, I think uh, this entire uh, disaster, this entire pandemic couldn't have been handled worse. Um, I, I, I feel very strongly that uh, uh, without, a, without, you know, it should have began, begun with the national quarantine. I, I, I can't imagine uh, how that did not happen. You know, I mean, when you think about the logic of trying to stop this thing, it has to happen all at once, you know, and... and, and and now it's just going to bounce from state to state, which we, we were very clear about by March, you know. Um, so I, I, I've been I've been like uh, I, I really think people are being bullied into going back to school. I think it's too early. Um, I think it's very, very dangerous for the teachers and I think it's dangerous for the students. And, and they're going to bring a, they're going to bring the virus back to, to their grandparents. We're already killing the greatest generation in, in, the, in nursing homes at the moment. And uh, it's just a terrible, terrible situation, you know? And I realize, um, you know, the whole economy priority, you know, but if it would had handled, been handled correctly, nobody would have lost their jobs. No companies would have gone under. It was a very simple, simple solution to this, which uh, I tweeted every single day for a month. Uh, trying to get a rise out of somebody. You know, I talked to senators and congressmen, governors, mayors, and I was like, this is really not that complicated. Um, we need a national quarantine, really for just a month, but let's, let's do three months to be safe. We need all the bills to stop, which means a phone call to the banks and a phone call to the landlords, you know? Let's give them a chance to be patriotic and show their gratitude to our wonderful country. A little sacrifice. Uh, and 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 then um, you know, uh, basically, um, we we had to give people money for, for food, you know. And I, and I suggested two thousand dollars a person for an adult and five hundred for a child per month, you know. And if we had done those things, um, we in, in March, you know, for April, May, and June, we could have came out July fourth and had a party. You know, and the virus would be gone and everybody can be going back to school. They could have enjoyed the beaches. I mean, it would have been, you know, uh, and, and I, I couldn't believe that, that nobody was was dealing with the obvious fact that if you don't do it simultaneously in all the states, then it's ir irrelevant. It, just as irrelevant as these tests are right now that are coming back four days later, five days later, eight days later, you know. We're hearing how we're doing more testing than anybody. Yeah, but the tests are completely irrelevant. You know, they need to be done in hours in order to be relevant, you know? Yeah. So, you know, and I, I said it's going to be in three stages. We're going we're gonna to all be online first, 
Second, people, once we have a test that's fast and accurate, then people can go back to work, you know, in terms of um, sporting teams or, or even band concerts, but with no audience, obviously. And then the third phase would be with the vaccine, then you can start adding the audience again. Well, we never, we never got to phase one, you know. And uh, so I think people are being bullied to, be, to go back to school right now by, by a completely incompetent government. We have Republicans right now refusing to give anybody any money for anything. I mean, how do you have people stay home for three months and give them a $1,200 check? What planet are they on? You know, I mean, come on. And, and most people didn't even get that 1200 by the way, that I know. But, but anyway, you know, it's ridiculous to sort of, you know, put the economy ahead of people's lives. And that's what we're doing right now out of pure incompetence and, and, and ignorance and stupidity, you know. And, and I just think it's a dangerous move. And I hope the teachers unions refuse to do it because uh, I just think it's a big mistake. T from kids from 10 years old up, can carry just as much virus as an adult, 10 years old up, you know? So, so you know, to me, it, it's just making matters even worse, you know, and I'm not sure what, how, what, I don't see the end in sight anymore. I mean, you know, it's just gonna keep bouncing around from state to state and then country to country, you know? So, I don't know. You know, in, in terms of the discussion around virtual learning, I would love to hear a little bit about how TROC had to pivot. This was an in-classroom, uh, resource for teachers. All of a sudden, no teachers are in the classroom anymore. Can you tell me a little bit about how uh, the initiative uh, sort of shifted to catch up to to the times? Well, actually, um, we were kind of lucky. We, we were ahead of the whole game because our entire thing is online. Uh, we have over 200 lessons online. Um, and we, we increased, you know, we, we put together some distance learning packages, but we were already online. Now, you know, that's wonderful, but but it's but it's all built to to of course be an interaction with the teachers. I mean, it's it was never meant to replace teachers, of course. But teachers have been telling me they've been using it at home for the homeschooling aspect of this whole pandemic, you know, and it's been working beautifully because the whole thing is online already, you know. So we didn't have to change a thing. Um, it was really kind of being ahead of the game in a, in a, in a way, you know. But, yeah. but, um, but, but, you know, but that, that will never replace, uh, you know, teachers in the classroom. I mean, you know, it was never meant to. And, and, that, and that, that's just a whole another dimension of, of the teaching process that is, of course, essential. And, and you know, we all want, we all want to go, have the kids go back to school. Of course, the teachers want it. Everybody wants it, you know. But uh, you can't just pretend that this virus is going to go away, you know, and, and but, you know, force people back into situations like they're doing in the meatpacking plants, you know, where people are dying left and right for the economy. It's sick, you know, it's, it's pathetic and, uh, and uh, it's despicable. And, 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 you know, we should not tolerate this kind of, this kind of thing in this country. It's a, it's a shame because we, you know, we, we, we know better, we know better and we should be doing better. You know, another thing that I want to talk about is the idea that so many of Teach Rock's lessons show how music can help students learn about social studies and history. And we're living in a historic moment right now in one of great social unrest and a, a really a reckoning. And I, I would love to hear from you how music and these lessons can really help students work through some of the discussions we're having as a country right now about race and civil rights and the protests surrounding the death of George Floyd. Well, our, our whole thing is built... Um with th three purposes in mind. First, to keep the arts in the DNA of the education system um, any way it, it, can, it, can, it can be used. Um, you know, the, the, the No Child Left Behind legislation really devastated a lot of the arts classes in the public, public school system and, and never really has recovered. And, and, and you know, and, and we're maybe never gonna put instruments in kids' hands again, not for a while anyway. So we decided let's do a history a music history curriculum instead, which is just easier to uh, sneak in. You know, we can put it in any grade level. We made it, we made it flexible enough for any grade level. Um, we, we can do cross-curricular. It can be music class, history class, uh, English class, social studies. It works everywhere, you know. Um, so that was our, our first mission was to, you know, arts integration uh, as often uh, as much as possible for a lot of reasons which we can go into. Uh, the second thing was, was to come up with a methodology that works for this generation. 
You know, we we have a whole new generation that's really quite a different species than we're used to. They're they're faster than us. They're smarter than us. You know, and and um, and, and and they have no patience whatsoever. You know, so you can't use the old methods that was that were used you know, with us, which is you know learn this now, and someday you'll use it. They don't. They don't understand that. They can get any answer they want on their device in 15 seconds. You know, so you have to capture their imagination. You know, and, and we have to do it in a way that, that that engages them by going to their world. You know, instead of dragging them to our old world, let's go to their world, and we use music for that. We say, "Who's your favorite artist?" They all have one. And if it's uh, Beyonce, we say, "Okay, where does she come from?" Let's trace her back. You know. Well, Beyonce comes from a woman called Aretha Franklin, you know, and she was in Detroit. We talk about Detroit and we talk about uh, uh, she came from the gospel church. We talk about the gospel church and she was involved in the civil rights movement. We talk about civil rights, you know, and the kids stay engaged because this is a, a comfortable subject for them, you know, and that's what the arts does in general. It gives them a comfort zone using a part of their brain that they all uh, have naturally, you know, emotion and instinct and imagination, you know. So, you know, a lot of kids are not comfortable with math and science at, at first, you know. So this kind of has a nice, it's a nice way of a, a transition to get them, get them comfortable with the education system, you know, the education process in general. And then hopefully that'll, you know, then translate to the, to the math and science, which they will eventually get to. You know, but we have to learn a, a simple fact that, that testing is not learning. You know, when, when are we going to when are we going to realize that testing is not learning? You know, and, and it, 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 so it, I think it's more important right now to teach kids how to think than what to think. You know, and, and that's what and that's what the arts, you know, the arts connects all those dots and, and, and fires different parts of the brain and, and, and kids all of a sudden. Uh, begin to be comfortable, you know. So that was our second mission. Our third mission was to deal with the with the dropout rate, which is just intolerable, you know. It's close to fifty percent in some of the poor neighborhoods, and 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 fifty percent of those kids end up in the, in the criminal justice system, you know. And that's that's just absolutely, uh, uh, you know, un unacceptable. And 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 every statistic shows if a kid uh, likes one single class or one single teacher, they'll come to school. If we can just keep them there through high school, you know, then they're gonna they're gonna have a shot. You know, we, we, they'll have a they'll, they'll have a shot in life. And that's and that's so that that's the three things that we we try to accomplish. You know, and uh, we just went public with it last year. We we, we have thirty thousand teachers registered already, but we um we wanted to make it. All we're doing is just supplying tools for teachers to use. You know. Uh, and, and, and we figure if to get the teachers excited, you know, they'll take care of the kids. You know, let, let's take care of the teachers first, you know? Yeah, and, and jo Joel, I want to, I'm sorry, Steve, I just want to bring Joel in here for, for a moment because, you know, I think that you might uh, often be working on the same goals here with maybe a little bit of a different method uh, in terms of, you know, reducing the dropout rate or uh, increasing the graduation rate. Uh, Joel, why don't you give me your thoughts on, on how education, how educators should maybe be rising to this moment, um, you know, of a time that's really difficult and traumatic for kids. Uh, and, and any thoughts you have on what Stevie's been saying? Yeah, so first of all, Steve, while you're talking in the chat that's going on here, you've already got a half a dozen votes for president of the United States. So. <laughs> I do. I do. I want to make sure I'm invited to the inaugural. That's, uh, so that's uh, already him. I'd vote for him, Stevie for president. No, I said, look, the kind of thing you're talking about, the arts in the schools are so vital. And it's, it's not a substitute for math and science. It's got to be part of an integrated, fully developed right. curriculum. The kids love it, the continuity of it. I did this thing with Carnegie Hall. We brought all sorts of people into the schools, musicians working with the kids. It's so exciting. So, you know, teacher art gets a lot of credit for this. One of the things in the chat, we're just talking about what they're doing for some people down in Tennessee. And what I love about what Stevie said was, this is, he gets a basic thing. You empower the teachers. You help the teachers do their work. And the question you raised is, you know, are there different methods? There are lots of different methods. The goal of getting our kids better, better educated, particularly children who come from communities that are traditionally underserved, that's a goal that not only do we have to share, we have to make happen. And it's going to take an all hands on deck. And one of the things that you got to say about our teachers they have adjusted overwhelmingly 
to the tragedies and the crises that we've had to deal with in the last several months, many of them going way above and beyond. And while Steve is obviously right, we don't want to send people back to school when it's unsafe. We ought to keep our focus on how can we safely return kids to school. Because at some point what happens is people rock into a different state of mind. They don't want to go back at some point. We've got to keep making sure safety first, but we've got to make sure we get kids back to school. And then the final point that I would make is it's groups like Teach Rock that are doing this kind of support that are out there really trying to help make the education system better. When, when I was chancellor, one of the things I found is the partnering with these community groups, getting them involved. You talked about the small schools we opened, Jillian. A lot of these groups really sponsored those schools, community groups. We'd have the Asian Society opening up schools, one of them in your borough in Staten Island. We'd have uh, Carnegie Hall working with us. We'd have Lincoln Center working with us. We'd have, you know, it's, and it's that all hands on deck. Let's make this happen for our children. That's really vital when it comes to education. And the school systems that work least well are those that are hermetically sealed, run by bureaucrats who don't want the kind of engagement that something like Teach Rock can help making them better. You know, at this point, I think it's time for us to, we're going to uh, have a little video interlude and then we're going to take some questions uh, from others as well. So let's pause here for a moment for a quick video about Teach Rock. coronavirus pandemic is not stopping thousands of mostly underprivileged city school students from virtually rocking out across the five boroughs. So you're kind of like sneaking uh, education in to fun art and learning stuff for the kids to do. And it's also, it all, I'm also teaching them things that they can do when they're not sitting with me in front of the screen too in their own time so they can be creative. Vincent Spencer is a comic book storytelling specialist at New York Edge, the largest provider of after-school programming in New York City. New York Edge has partnered with music legend Stephen Van Zandt's Rock and Roll Forever Foundation to teach rock online for kids to stay connected through the universal language, music. When I make it fun and keep it interactive, and I'm uh, messing around with them, they're having a great time. So again, the idea is to keep it fun. And that takes the stress away. Give them some teaching so they can take back and get a little bit smarter. And uh, it all works out for everybody. Teach Rock distance learning packs are designed for teachers to deliver directly to students during periods of remote education. Distance learning packs are music-fueled, standards-aligned, activity and project-based, culturally responsive, and always free. Teach Rock's library of more than 80 distance learning packs are used by over 100 public schools in the New York Edge system and throughout the Grammy Museum's remote education programs. Visit teachrock.org donate to learn how you can help music connect us, even when we must be apart. Hi, I'm Stevie Van Zandt. Ten years ago, I joined with teachers associations in their efforts to preserve music and arts education in schools. We both believe music is the most solid common ground to establish communication between teachers and students. And that's where education begins. I want to thank you, teachers, for everything that you do, and I hope to see you soon. Be good to your teachers. Take a teacher to lunch. Buy a cup of coffee. Say thank you to your teachers. Well, now I want to uh, bring in Christine Nick, the Director of Policy and Outreach at the Rock and Roll Forever Foundation. She is currently pursuing her doctorate in instructional leadership at Hunter College, the City University of New York, where her research focus is on open educational resources and how they can be leveraged for equity. And she's gonna join us with some questions, Christine. Hi everyone. Um, so I have a couple of questions that I thought we could consider. Um, it's been said that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste and I was wondering what everyone's thoughts were in terms of what changes schools should be considering making uh, in a res as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. So let, let me start on that because I, I, I think one really great thing that's happened is people in the private sector 
people in the not-for-profit world are bringing more resources, developing more materials, and teachers are getting more comfortable using those materials. And to me, that's always been a very good thing. You know, in education, there's a certain kind of inertia toward change. And so here, because there is a crisis, people have to adapt. And when people have to adapt, sometimes they become more creative, try new things because they have to, whereas otherwise they may not. And that, I think, is all to the good. And I, I think there will be benefits. I think people who learn about who's watching this and learn about what Teach Rock is doing and think about how they can bring that into the schools, that's a good thing. And if it's done properly, it's a really good thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think uh, one, one of the nice things that's happened, you know, in spite of the circumstances, uh, you know, with the parents being home also, you know, I've been encouraging people to, to, to do our lessons together, you know, the, the, the parents and the kids together, you know, and, and the teachers, you know, the three, the three of them working together on these things, which is a completely unique situation that, you know, hopefully will never happen again. But, but you know, since it is happening, it's kind of a unique moment, you know, to have the teachers were interacting with the parents and, and the students at the same time, you know. And I thought, you know, that's kind of a healthy thing. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping something comes out of that, you know, between the, because our, our lessons are fun for both the parents and the kids, you know. And, and, um, and, I, and I think, I think that's, that's what's happening. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people who are saying, you know, we're enjoying the lessons uh, as, as parents, <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't know what our kid, you know, our kid may be getting something out of it, but I'm, I'm learning things, <laughs> you know. But it, it, it's, it, the interaction is, is what's important, you know, between parents and, and, and kids, you know. And I don't think, I, I, you know, other than this circumstance, when, when is that going to happen when, you know, you have, you know, parents are out of work, you know, and the kids are home from school? It's a very strange situation. So maybe something good can come out of that, you know, just, interacting with each other and learning a little bit more about each other because uh, you know most kids you know don't realize their parents are human beings till they're like they're in their 40s you know, <laughs> you know, it's, you know oh my parents are actually human beings so it, it's nice to hopefully there's some interaction going on there yeah mark mark twain said when he was 18 he thought his parents were idiots he was amazed how much they grew up by the time he was 28. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jillian, Harris, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, sure. Well, you know, I, I think one of the things that's interesting is that's actually a phrase that was used by the New York City Public Schools Chancellor a couple of times uh, in covering him over the last couple of months. And one, one area where I think it's definitely been applied in New York is the idea of closing the digital divide. It took too long, I think, pretty frankly, to get every student in the city uh, online, but at the end of this, all of those children will eventually or do eventually have either an, iP an iPad hooked up to the internet or a Chromebook or something like that where they can get online. And those are things that some of those students didn't have before. I think this has also provoked conversations about internet access in city uh, homeless shelters where uh, unfortunately many students live. And so, you know, this got this, these are things that we've talked about for a long time, but this really created the urgency to force people to do something about it. And I think that's something that will make a difference going forward. Mm. And Christine, did you have a, an, another one? Sure. Um, so I was also wondering, you know, it's been one of the thing, one of the problems facing education for a long time is teacher attrition rates, specifically new teachers. Uh, studies show that something like 50% of teachers leave the profession within the first five years. What do you guys think can be done to make the profession more attractive to get teachers, get young people to join the profession to begin with, but then also to stay in it long term? Pay them. <laughs> How about we start with that? <laughs> Go ahead, Joel. All right, sorry. Go ahead. You take, you take it, Julian. I, I always like to see when people who do the reporting have to answer the question. So, <laughs> you know, it, that's a tough one for me to answer, only because uh, so a lot of my friends are teachers. I mean, like I said, I, I grew up uh, in New York City and I attended New York City public schools, and I know a lot of teachers, uh, which is really handy for an education reporter, I have to say. But you know, I think it is true that people do cycle out quickly, uh, and and it can be a very stressful job where people, I, I think, would like to maybe make some more money. Um, you know, I, I think there's been a big uh, push uh, towards coaching and other efforts to retain 
and look, you know, I know some people who were who have been teachers for many, many years and some people who did it for a short period of time and moved on. Uh, so I, I think this is a question that the city and, and really any district has been grappling with for a long time. No, it's a, it's a big problem. I, I think you touch on some of the points. Obviously, the way we pay teachers matters. I mean, you think about pe people trying to survive in New York City on what a starting salary can be. So I think you got to address that kind of thing. And you touch on something, Jillian, that I think is important and gets missed by a lot of people. And that is for a young teacher, a first year, second year teacher, they end up in these schools, they get very little support. They don't get the kind of mentoring. They don't get the kind of role modeling that they need. And I think schools that run well really get behind in the early years the supports that they need to give. And we got to think much more about that. I, I, I was amazed when I became chancellor how isolated new young teachers felt and how kind of little professional development they were getting, how little mentorship, how they didn't form support groups to help work with each other. So I think if you get the economics right and you get the kind of conditions of working together, supporting each other, the training, I think that can matter a tremendous amount. But it is, it's heroic work. And I, I will say this, I think being a teacher, giving your life to these kids, particularly kids who come to school with a lot of challenges, which a lot of kids in New York City do, doing that is to me the most noble work you can do. It really is. Absolutely right. I, 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 I agree. I think they should be thought of as the same essential workers as our, our police, uh, our firemen, and, 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 and our military. You know, they're, the teachers are on the front lines every single day in a war against ignorance. And man, do we need that war fought right now, you know? Yeah, we need uh, one. Yeah. I mean, so aside from paying them, which, you know, might be a good idea, you know, uh, what, they're, what they deserve. I think also, you know, what we tried to um, create and design within our curriculum was the ability for teachers to express themselves. You know, I think that's important, too. I think it's important for any worker, really, you know, any, anybody who has a job to have a, a relationship with that job that's more than just uh, mechanical, you know. Uh, and, and we tried to really encourage teachers uh, – we designed it in a way that they can spend more time on one particular era if they want to, one particular genre if they want to, you know, maybe something that was familiar to them that they knew more about. You know, that's fine. Let, let, let the teachers express them, themselves and, 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 and become engaged in their work in, in, a, in, a, in a more emotional way. And I think that'll, that would help uh, keep them around, you know, because I think that's true with anybody, uh, not, not just teachers, but you know, if you're not engaged in your work in some emotional connection, you know, then it's gonna you're gonna come and go. You know, because it doesn't mean anything to you. You know, but I think in a, in a, in, a, in the case of teachers, it's especially important because they have to pass along, they have to have enthusiasm that then gets passed along. That's an unusual job. You know, that might be the only job in the world where that's important. You know, passing along that kind of enthusiasm is gonna change somebody's life. I mean, for the rest of their life, they're going to remember that good teacher, you know? And, and uh, so, so giving them a little freedom, a little bit of, a, a little bit of creativity, you know, let them, have, let them be a little bit creative in what they're doing. And I think people would, you know, stick around a lot longer. You know? Thank you. And thank you, Christine, for those questions. We have a question coming up next from former New Jersey Senator Bill Bradley. I'll read that question for you. Uh, and it is, given your experience in New York City, so I'm thinking this is for you, Joel, <laughs> what is the biggest obstacle to making the K through 12 educational system better? So first of all, let me say, I'm, I'm glad Bill put a question up. And you know, Steve, a lot of people here were gonna support you for president. And I think one of the sadnesses in this country is that Bill Bradley never became president. Uh, I agree, I agree. Man of, of character, conviction and leadership and we desperately need that. And I, I salute you for your service, Bill. Look, I think the hardest thing about any changing any system like a public school system in a city or a state is all of the politics, all of the bureaucrats, all of the things that get in the way of unleashing what you want to unleash, which is the kind of change. And I think Stevie touched on a little bit in terms of creativity. 
but it is a system that really saps the energy. And I remember when I was a young lawyer, I used to always have this joke about they had light bulb jokes. And one joke question was, how many psychiatrists does it take to change the light bulb? The answer is only one, but the light bulb really has to want to change. And the answer to Bill's question is the system is so entrenched, so bureaucratized, so ossified that you sap all the energy and it's hard to get people to change, to think differently, to innovate. And so that to me is the set of challenges that you need to get to. Uh, the whole issue of resources is important, all these other things, but systems that basically sap human vitality are systems that inevitably are not going to work very well. And the school systems throughout America are so bureaucratized and so kind of anti-innovation. So to me, the, that that's the greatest impediment, Bill. And let, let's take a look at our next question uh, from those who are joining us today. It's from Boaz Weinstein, and here is his question. Uh, He's, I'll read it in full. Uh, he writes, I'm honored to follow Bill Bradley, who was a hero of my late father, and also because my wife, uh, who is running for Manhattan DA, and Bill share something in common. They're both Rhodes Scholars from New Jersey. So there you go. Uh, my question for Joel is whether he thinks that because of the wildly divergent experiences students are having in distance learning from one school to the next, should the Federal Department of Education or other education leaders determine the best uh, of the best in online learning tools and advise schools to assimilate them into their curriculums rather than the current ad hoc approach. In my personal experience, he says, I've been super impressed with the course offerings available on brilliant.org, for instance. So the, the answer, Boaz, is yes, I wouldn't have the federal government do it. If the federal government get in the middle of it, it's going to get wrapped up in politics and controversy and all this sort of stuff. What I would do is create the kind of systems and allow people to be able to evaluate, give feedback. This goes to Jillian's early question about get some data on things that are working on engagement, on performance, and so forth. And I think you can structure it a variety of ways. You can get different school superintendents, state commissioners, and so forth. But yes, I think it's a very good idea. Well, I think our time together uh, may be drawing down. And I, you know, I'd love to hear any uh, concluding thoughts uh, from, from both of you, uh, you know, g g give me your thoughts. As, uh, Joel, let's go to you first, and then we'll, we'll close with, uh, with Stevie. No, no, my thought is I'm, I'm so happy I had the opportunity to do this. And look, anytime you can shine a light on education, I mean, we're talking about, and you, you several times brought up, Jillian, about the, the issues we face when we're dealing with as a country now when it comes to race and when it comes to our history. And one piece, it's not the only piece, but it's an essential piece, is to make sure every kid in every zip code of every color and every national origin gets a really fair shot with a great education. And I'll be the first to tell you, that's not happening in America today. And it's got to change. Because if we don't change that, we'll give you, we're going to take away the essential building blocks from a kid's life. So I want to thank you people for putting on this show today and focusing on education. Education is usually a yawn for most people. And with Stevie here, we now made it sexy. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, uh, we've got to stop taking teachers for granted. Okay, let's just start there, right? We've been taking them for granted for a hundred years, you know, forever. And that needs to stop number one, like I say, to treat them as the essential workers that they are, you know, and, and our, our public school systems have, have got to be given uh, more, more resources and, and, uh, and let's, let's, you know, let, let's act like it is the most important thing for our future because it is, you know, and the other thing is we, we, we need to integrate the arts um, and every grade level in every discipline and and uh, and make that a standard practice, uh, a standard part of the methodology of, of the teaching process. You know, let's not treat art as as uh, you know. We we we're the only country in the world that thinks art is a luxury. You know, it's an essential part of the quality of life, and I, and I believe an essential part of the education process. And it's been it's been left out and ignored, and has never been used properly. Uh, 
um, you, you know, for some reason, you know, it's some, it's like a, it's like an after school, uh, you know, thing and it shouldn't be, it should be integrated into the school system itself. And I think, uh, if we do that, we're going to start to see a change, uh, in the attitudes of people, the attitudes of the students and teachers. And I think it will eventually really will, will help us improve our graduation rate. And we have to do that. Yeah. Now, before we wrap up, I do want to share some comments from those of us who are uh, watch. Uh, those of you who are watching, Linda Romero. Uh, she writes, "Arts in schools is so important. I believe it enhances the child's ability to absorb other subjects." I think that exactly. really gets to the heart of it. Uh, exactly. Mr. Mosley, the music teacher, writes, "On behalf of my entire school community in Brooklyn, thank you, Stevie Van Zant and Teach Rock, for your vision, leadership, and support." He's on hashtag Team Teach Rock. Uh, Ben Wides writes, I used tons of Teach Rock curriculum during remote learning. Engagement was more important than ever with the switch to remote, and the Teach Rock materials are completely engaging. Amen. Uh, right. Dana, Dana Orlack, she writes, uh, yes, I teach an entire class that revolves around the Teach Rock curriculum, and the DLPs were such an amazing resource during the remote learning period. And Shauna Longo, she as she's sharing, uh, the Teach Rock curriculum and lessons were an amazing resource for, for teachers in any environment, especially the DLPs for remote learning. It's all about making as many connections as we can for kids, which really gets to so much of what we were talking about. Drew Van, uh, Drew Van Huss, he writes, thank you for caring about the arts, education, and teachers. So, you know, I think really, I mean, how, what better way to sum it up uh, today? Uh, I thank all of you for joining us. I thank you, uh, Joel Klein and Stevie Van Zant. It was an absolute pleasure to facilitate this discussion uh, and talk about these important issues with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. And thank you, Joel, for your kind words. And uh, thank you for doing this, Jillian. It's good. Good. Absolutely. I was really glad to be here. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a great evening and uh, stay safe and healthy. You too.